You are tuned into the History Brats Podcast, sponsored by Churchill Publishing. Join Holly and Kathy as they wind their way through all things historical, relevant, and Henry Cavill. Go ahead, grab a glass of Prosecco, chill out, and enjoy. Hi guys, Holly and I are back and we're going to talk to you today or talk with you today about one of my most favorite people in the whole wide world, who's really not in the whole wide world now, of course, but <laughs> Elizabeth of York. Anybody in today's world who studies the monarchy has to know that Elizabeth of York has to be considered the matriarch of, of the current monarchy because it was through her and her husband, Henry Tudor, that this current almost Plantagenet dynasty exists. The Windsors, everybody come from Elizabeth of York. So we want to talk a little bit about Elizabeth of York today because we're keying in on the important women of the Tudor period. Yeah. Last time we did um, her mom, Elizabeth Woodville, and Margaret Beaufort, who of course is Henry VII's uh, mother. And so we'd like to move on because we, Holly and I both, we, it's weird because we consider Elizabeth of York to be the matriarch. But then she has matriarchs above her because I don't ever want to diminish the importance of Elizabeth Woodville and Margaret Beaufort because they were, they, were it not for them, we wouldn't have Elizabeth York and Henry Tudor. So, so let's just start there. How did Elizabeth of York get in the situation that she was in? Yeah. Simple. She was born to Elizabeth Woodville and King Edward the Fourth, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I never I get so confused sometimes. I always say fifth and I'm like, nope, four. Oh, four. I know, because every time everybody mentions Edward five, I'm like, who? You know, well, we'll get to that, of course, but um and Elizabeth and uh Elizabeth and Edward produced many children, but Elizabeth of York was their oldest. And Elizabeth lived had the kind of unfortunate status of being the oldest because she had to live through an incredibly turbulent time. Um, Edward, as we know, um, it's some say usurped, some people say earned, but took the crown from Henry the seventh, Henry the sixth. And it's always been kind of questioned how all that really came about, but suffice to say, we had York Lancaster, York won the day. Lancaster bit the dust, and they had children, the oldest of whom was Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth had to live through really, really turbulent times with her parents because her her father had to fight repeatedly, not in the same way that Henry Tudor had to fight. Edward IV actually lost the crown a couple of times and had to get it back. So this really impacted how Elizabeth viewed being king or being queen. I mean, I think that, that from a very young age, she learned that there was a game to play and, and the game was truly life or death. Yeah. Um, as she would find out, she of course was the older sister of King Edward V. Yeah. And Richard Shrewsbury, Duke of York, correct? Yeah. yeah. And these of course were the, the infamous princes in the tower who were mysteriously killed, stolen, whatever the current hypothesis is, by yeah. either their uncle Richard III or Margaret Beaufort or someone else involved in the Tudor Tudor line. So we don't know, but we know but when you when you factor all this together, you have Elizabeth of York living through probably one of the most traumatic periods of the Wars of the Roses, and maybe one of the most traumatic periods in Plantagenet history. I mean, Absolutely. because this this truly was cousin against cousin. Earlier in the Plantagenets, it was just holding on to power against other people, but then it came down to the Plantagenets actually fighting against one another. White Rose York, Red Rose Lancaster, and this yeah. is the this is the background that Elizabeth of York was born into, 
So she had to have grown up spending time in sanctuary, coming out of sanctuary, being princess again, all these things kept changing for her. And, and nothing, nothing about Elizabeth's childhood was stable except maybe the first 10 years yeah. when it was pretty solid. So of course, we have Edward dying in 1483. And her brother, Edward V, to be coronated after his father's death. And that doesn't happen. For, and, and that's a whole nother podcast in itself. Um, but suffice to say that uh, Elizabeth is now kind of out on her can because her father is no longer king. Richard has usurped the throne. Her brothers have disappeared. It's kind of what is what is going to happen to me? And again, this is where we go back to our incredible matriarchs, Elizabeth and Margaret, who step in and say, "Okay, look, let's end this. Let's yes. let's have Henry Tudor, Margaret's son, um, go up against Richard III, and if he wins and is king of England, Elizabeth of York will be queen." Yep. And that's what happens, and so is established the Tudor dynasty. Okay the Tudor dynasty, okay? So that's where we are. And of course, then she has Arthur, Margaret, Mary, and Henry. Henry. <laughs> so, the, you know, kind of, it, it gives you an insight into how this whole, and even Mary, Queen of Scots, I mean, they're all, they all come down from Elizabeth of York. Absolutely. Um, it's funny because, as whenever we're talking about these people, I can't help but draw comparisons. And as you're talking about Elizabeth of York, I'm kind of, as I'm stepped back, I'm kind of thinking, you know, her life mirrors almost a lot of um, Elizabeth I and, and, and Mary Tudor, um, Henry's daughter, uh, Henry VIII's daughter, yep. you know, in different ways, but one minute they were princes says one minute they weren't these women that we talk about these strong women seem to have had such a rough time of it compared to the men of course the men had a rough time the men you know but the women they were absolutely beaten and battered and and god knows what well if you think about elizabeth of york she had the really unenviable position of being yeah. margaret beaufort's daughter-in-law and yeah. elizabeth woodville's daughter okay that cannot have been easy on any level. She was untouchable. Yeah. Um, she is kind of the the epitome of royal blood. Um, and not only that, then her kids, her children were as royal as you could possibly get. Yep. Um, because of her marriage to Henry VII, they created this untouchable line of of monarchs. It was... Uh, unbelievable the amount of royal blood that were in that was in their veins um and yet <laughs> and yet even as royal as they were yeah they still struggle i mean i yeah. can't, i can't even imagine i can't imagine the position that she was in okay did she feel at times that she would well there are those who say that she should have been queen regnant that she was the next york in line yeah. okay so so knowing that or, or having that in her consciousness and henry let's be real the tudor the tudor line was a stretch on the lancasters of the lancasters i mean they weren't you know they weren't totally the the royalty came from elizabeth of york it really did so you ask, you have to ask yourself, what kind of a person was she? Yeah, I might have gotten a little sassy, you know, oh, yeah. about it. Like, I hey, you know, but she apparently didn't. By all accounts, she's she's described as kind and gentle. Um, Jodie Comer might take wow. <laughs> wow. 
I if honestly she is my favorite portrayal of Elizabeth. I know, I know. She, it was Ever awesome. To be. Um, I mean, let's not get me started on this actress because you know the girl crush I've got on this woman is absolutely unbelievable. She she's she's perfect in so many ways, you know, in all the roles she does. I mean, but uh, Elizabeth of York was just her role. Um, and I mean, both actors, both of the main actors, um, I'm trying it's to think fabulous. of the guy's name. Um, Jacob played, something. Uh, Jacob. Yeah, but he, he was just, and I remember at the time when I was watching it and I, I had a little look because I thought, you know, you know, you know how everyone does it. You're watching a show and you go on IMDb because you're thinking, where have I seen this guy before? And he's been in absolutely nothing. Um, but he was just so good. He just fitted the role perfectly. And I could not imagine a better uh, Elizabeth of York and Henry VII. And we talk about this all the time. Um, you know, who did you prefer playing Anne Boleyn? Who do you prefer playing Elizabeth I? But, and often it is it's usually you know rather old films that we kind of say you know we love Genevieve Bajold or, oh, yeah. or what, but this was so modern in a way but absolutely just just brilliant um she really it, and I do you think we think that Jodie Comer absolutely nailed it okay but did she nail the real Elizabeth of York or did she nail what we would think of her as today well I don't, I don't know no I don't know and, and, and when you do read about when you do read about her she definitely was softer um she was more gentle um and she wasn't one to we have a lot of these women then um a lot of queens um that would kind of step in on the politics you know by the time we trickle down to some of Henry Dick's wives <laughs> they they were very interested in politics, very interested in the affairs of the country. Whereas Elizabeth of York was more for her husband. You know, she stood behind her husband. She wasn't out to push her political beliefs necessarily. Um, you know, she really was. She was more for her kids and her family, and she took her role as queen very seriously. But we we've got to remember, even though there's not a huge gap between Elizabeth of York and then some of Henry VIII's wives there's a big enough gap that times were very different when Elizabeth of York was queen to when, and, and even with his wives, you know, their views were unheard of, you know, for them to st stand up to their husband, particularly a queen that was a king even, that was unheard of. Um, but it is a different time. One of the things, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember the white, the white princess going to Elizabeth's death. I don't think it went there. No. Because they picked that up in the Spanish book. No. It kind of gave that air of, is there going to be another series? Because there's so much more they could do with it. Um, you know, I think they could quite, quite happily add another series. I mean, the only thing they have added a second series to is the Spanish princess, um, which I'm currently re-watching re at the moment. Um, it's all right. What? It has done for me what the what the white queen and the right white princess did yeah i had trouble with spanish princess because i just hated how they portrayed elizabeth of york in it yeah um, but one of the one of the things that has always torn at my heart and has made me lean to the she was strong but gentle and and decisive but that she really really loved henry was after yeah. the death of arthur when yeah. she said, you know, we can have another baby. Oh, God, no. Do you love a man? Right? Who, that's that's just the, incredible to me. The, the importance of what he needs above what you actually need at that time. And, I mean, when she died, okay, childbirth was, you know, the main factor. But there's a huge part of me that just thinks she didn't want to fight it either. Um, I mean, losing her born child just shouldn't happen. You know, it, it's just awful. And in that time, the, those things happened a lot more often than they should have. Um, what concerns me the, terribly about that whole thing 
is that the child, I think her name was Catherine. I'm not 100%, or maybe that was the last baby. I don't remember. But the baby before this one, she had had a tough time coming back from, and it yeah. died. Yeah. So, you know, she had to know. She had to know that she was really rolling the dice, you know, to, to make Henry happy. So that, to me, kind of differs from the calmer yeah. portrayal. Because I, you know, even though in that one, you, you definitely felt like that by the end, they, they loved each other. They did. I don't see the Jodie Comer Elizabeth volunteering for that. No, absolutely not. Um, you know, I think we have to give a bit of leeway with these shows because they're, they, they're going off for, they know as much as we know, you right. know, they, they are, it's, it's almost like when we write historical fiction, you know, we're using as much of the truth as we can and then we're filling in and it's the same with these shows and, you know, I think with what Jodie Comer had to work with, she did an excellent job. And if she wanted to add a bit of flair, I'm not against that. I'm totally not against that because it's what we do. You know, it's, it's I'm what- I'm just thinking that. Here, yeah. you've, here you've written on Anne Boleyn and you're writing on Mary Stewart. Yeah. And I've written on Elizabeth of York. Yeah. So it's like, when, when we as authors sit down, I know we've discussed this a million times, but I don't really think people get this. You know, I think they think that we sit down and we write these stories that are just, you know, fantastic and we make up and we see this and we do that. We don't. You know, we, what we are doing is trying to put ourselves in a position that it's almost impossible to be in. Yeah. There is no way that you know exactly what Anne Boleyn was thinking or feeling or Mary Stewart or me with Elizabeth of York. There's no way. So yeah. what we do is we take our feeling about that character or that person and we try to imbibe them with these qualities that we believe they yeah. show. Absolutely. Why, and this is one of the reasons why going back to our last podcast, we have so many tremendous disagreements over Margaret Beaufort, not you and I, but you know, people yeah. in general, you yeah. know, it, it, was she a good person? Was she a bad person? I don't, I'm not sure she was either one really. I think she just was a survivor. She I was, mean, we've said it before, um, you know, a couple of things. One that we can't judge them by today's standards because it was exactly. a And two, no one is completely good or bad. You know, we've said it about Anne Boleyn in particular, right. when we talk about and, and you know in the book and I try it, it's that thing of you know I believe overall she was a good person you know but she she had she did the odd bad thing or had the odd bad quality I, I know for a certain I've got you know exactly. bad about me and, and and things I do that I shouldn't do so why were they any different it's because we're we're stood back and we're looking at it we're not in the situation. Um, and and most of us are quite frankly happy not to be in that situation. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't know anybody who would exchange their life for Anne Boleyn. No. I wouldn't exchange it for Mary Stewart. No, definitely I, not. I mean, you know, there's these are these are people, I wouldn't even do it for Elizabeth of York. No. I, I wouldn't want her life. You would love to have a window into that life. Exactly. And that's what we think. That's what we're trying to do when we write about these historical people. It's not, yeah. we're not trying to rewrite history. You know, we're just trying to interpret it as best we can, you know, with respect to the circumstances we're in now and the circumstances they were in then. You know, and, and I, do, I do get my panties in a wad. You know, when yeah. people come back to us as authors and say, well, that didn't happen or, you know, it couldn't have happened that way. Why not? Yeah. You know, uh, why you couldn't it? Do. Yeah. I mean, no. the truth of the matter is, like with Elizabeth of York, there's facts. These are the facts. These are the facts. These are the facts. Like when yeah. you're writing, those are the stanchions. You, you, you write around and around and around these facts. Okay. And I think that's a hard thing in a way 
you you don't realize i think some people almost think and i've had conversations before where people have said you know historical fiction right it must be easy because you've got the story it's far from it because that story is the thing that makes it almost harder because you've got these points in their lives that you absolutely have to include right it's like when when the mary queen of scots movie came out yeah. everybody had a shit hemorrhage over the fact that at the end you know mary and elizabeth met which we know yeah. never happened okay that i take exception with when you yeah. when you change a, an actual fact i have so this is what people need to understand when they look at us as historical writers is that we have to respect what happened and we're not trying to rewrite it but we're trying to put maybe another way of seeing things and maybe this maybe it could have happened this way and let's think about this i mean god knows history itself is just one big mystery yeah and i know a lot like me you know we both love to to push to push it almost yeah. Say, let's try thinking about it this way. We know we've been told it was most likely this way, but I like to try and put myself in the what if situation, you yeah. know, um, because we just don't know. It was such different extremes of life. Um, one question I was thinking about a little, a little what back when we started this podcast um, with Elizabeth of York, you know, when when her father had died, and um, when her brother had died. Um, or disappeared or you know whatever happened they weren't around anymore and Richard was fully on the throne did she I mean we know how strong a character Elizabeth Woodfield was we know that Elizabeth was calling the shots at this point we know that you, you know she she was too she was so such a strong character and she would it, it was just you know her daughter would have listened to her yeah but what uh, you know in her mind did she weigh up the options? You know, she's got Richard. She, there's a possibility that she could have married Richard at oh, one point. Dust. Yeah. Um, the, you know, dust. Just, the stayed in Richard's camp, which could have possibly been the safer option. Um, obviously, it turned out that it wasn't, but from her standpoint, it may have been. But, and then, you know, the, would, okay, if she had married Richard, Henry Tudor would have been out. Gone. There yeah, would have been, would no, have been no, no Tudor dynasty. It wouldn't have been anything. The people would have stood behind Edward the Fourth's daughter. Yeah. They would have. They loved her. She she was adored. Um, but, they and they, they then, did her shit. You know, if she's, you know, if she's okay with Richard, then this must not have happened. You know, the thing, the thing about it with both Richard and Henry and the princes. You know, everybody, we know that everybody involved had good reason to, to make them disappear. Okay. Yeah. We, we understand that. But I think it's really telling that neither one of these guys was able to prove that the other one did it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. if you, if you want to look at it that way, and, and in other words, Richard, never was able to prove anything about it okay whether he yeah. tried or not i don't know but so that leads us back to elizabeth woodville okay yeah how badly does she want her daughter on the throne well this and i mean this is the, the thing i was kind of playing with in my mind you know we've got we've got the stand behind richard option we've got the henry option which honestly i believe there's a part of me that that feels she was swayed towards henry because she possibly thought that it was more likely that Richard had something to do with her brother's disappearance. Um, but then also there is a part of me that thinks, was there at any point a moment where Elizabeth, both Elizabeth, her and her mother, thought, can I do this on my own? I'm the eldest. You know, I am, I'm technically, I am next in line. Um, yes, I'm a woman. You know, it's not heard of necessarily. But can I do this? You know, and, it, it, and that, about it is, is the regnancy was only a generation away. With really, it's that close. It is that close. Yeah. 
and you know at the time it was unheard of and it and was it a fault in her mind we don't know because she was brought up in the time where that didn't happen so we really don't know if she even considered it um but she was bright it was that close it was so close to a moment where england changed so dramatically oh um, and, and even if you think about it had she chosen richard yeah it it would be totally different we don't even know um i can't even imagine what what england would be like now because you'd still be catholic yeah absolutely that it, it's that simple we would still be a catholic nation um you know i can't see in any other situation we would have changed um you would yeah, have had you know i mean to 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 a, and I think that's why it's why I'm really excited that we're doing this series about the Tudors. Um, I know they've been done to death, but everybody loves the Tudors. But yeah. I can't even imagine now life without the Tudors. Okay, <laughs> I, I can't yeah. even imagine as horrible as they were, and they were. Yeah, they were also incredible. They were yeah, incredible. They were ingrained into English life. Not even English life. I mean, it does spread as far, you know, it does spread out. They are so ingrained in in our history. Um, it's just as much bad that came from them, a lot of good came from them, um, you know, like you just said. And yeah, it was a time, it was a time of a lot of, a lot of gruesomeness, a lot of bloodiness, you know. It, 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 but it's just. I mean, and I think. Wonder, make, well, you, I wonder if Richard and Elizabeth would have had children. I, you know, I'm thinking about that because then we've got Anne Neville. Uh, Dead. And she did cross my mind just now. Because, yeah, you know, and I don't know. I think it would be so totally different. It, it, it would be. It, it would be. I think Elizabeth York of York would have become lost in history had she married Richard. Yeah, she would have. You know, to an extent, she to an extent, she's not lost by any means. No. Extent, she is a lot. I don't know the right way to phrase it because I don't want to say lesser. I don't want to, you know, because she, the amount of love we have for this woman is unbelievable. So we can't say lesser or anything like that. But. She doesn't she get the credit she deserves. Yeah, she is overshone a lot. Um, you know, until a certain point, and I know it sounds awful, she she was outshined to me by her mother because I had such great affection for her mother. Um, you know, and she she's really moved into my view a lot more in the past year or so. That was one of the things when I wrote my book that really I wanted to do was was to bring her out of Woodville's shadow. Yeah. To show that she was, you know, her own woman. Yeah. And yes, she, you know, did she go along with things? But back then, you, you had to go along with them or you died or something, you know, or you disappeared. Yeah. I mean, there had to be, and I've thought about this a lot. Can you imagine just all things out, else out of your mind? You are a queen, whether you're Anne Neville or Elizabeth Woodville or Elizabeth of York, you're a queen. You're Anne Boleyn, although, or Catherine of Aragon. Yeah. How do you sleep? Do you sleep with one eye open? I mean, the, the whole thing about it was you had to trust this little group that was around you. Yeah. And as you are finding out with Mary Stewart, Oh my God. That group was smaller and smaller. And it's interesting that you bring up Mary because like we said before, I'm writing at the moment, she's in the thick of her marriage to Darnley. And, you know, in my writing, she's in the thick of, of being in Scotland and all this. And as you're writing, you realize just how small that group is when you can name a, less than a handful of people that she could fully trust. And she's laying in her bed and, and Rizzio has just been killed. How yeah. do you feel? How do you feel? 
I mean, her whole council was in on it. You know, everyone she's meant to trust was in on it. Um, It's just, it's just unbelievable to have been a queen at that time. It's just, you can, and, and they had to make such, I think, you know, when we think of Elizabeth of York, okay, the way they portrayed it in the White Queen with the Perkin Warbeck thing, and again with the um, Spanish princess, they might have laid it on a little too thick, I think, you know, but with that, she had to stand back and watch as this, this intruder, this imposter was executed, and also her cousin, you know, we've got... We've that, was, got that was disgraceful. Teddy Plantagenet, you know, it's... Yeah, that was the last Plantagenet. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that to me was absolutely disgraceful. But in one of the things that I learned in doing my research, and I did put it in the book, although I probably should have emphasized it more, she never saw Perkin yeah. the best. Yeah, which, again, which we have totally different... different. It's shown differently in, in The White Princess, and... That's fine, you know. It's it's got fine. It, it made it, it, it still, when you watch the, uh, when you watch the White Princess and he's executed, you still don't really know what she's thinking, okay? Is it her brother or isn't her, her brother? But that was one of the things that struck me about Henry. Yeah. He would not allow her to see Perkin Warbeck. Yeah. Now, if he that, knew, if he knew that the princes were dead, yeah, he would have let her see them. He see him. In my mind, there's. I will be honest. There's never been a question about the princes in the tower, even to the point when I talk about it with with people and they ask me about them. I explain it as, oh yeah, so you know, this guy Richard III killed them. And that's it. And I know I know that that's bad from my point of view because I should be giving it more of a. But in uh, my, no. uh, uh, it, I, it's not necessarily that that's true. Um, I, you know, I'm, we'll never know. And I'm, and I'm one of those. And I'm, as you know, trying to dig into that a little bit more. But the yeah. thing, the thing that that gets me is, with respect to Perkin Warbeck, didn't Maggie? see him margaret um you know clarence george's daughter saw warbeck in burgundy with margaret yeah, i believe so um they do, again it's something they touch on in the in the white queen uh yeah. princess <laughs> in the white princess and they do show they do show maggie going over there and and she was she was made to say yeah that it was him yeah or, or she did that you know so the whole thing is very very confusing but if the one per, and and what about her other siblings her other yeah. siblings surely could have seen him how much and and this is another thing i was thinking about how much are her siblings mentioned you know once edward the fourth dies um and the princes in the tower are gone Obviously, they don't cease to exist, but we don't hear about them. They're never no. focused. Um, the, only you know, one, the only one we hear about is the sister that was close to her in age. The youngest one, Bridget, was in a nunnery. Yeah. Uh, you know, but it, it, I can't, and, and the sister's name escapes me, which is weird because it's in, it's in the book. I've got Cecily in my mind. Cecily, that's it, Cecily. Cecily. Uh, and they had a real, you know, back and forth, uh, a yeah. real sibling thing going there too, which makes Elizabeth all the more human. But I don't understand why, if it were my brother that I thought was dead, After now. I would be like downtown <laughs> checking it out. You but know? It was things and they, they, they do explain it beautifully in, in, in these TV shows in the sense that yes, she could she could, I'm trying to think how to frame it, you know, she could go ahead and, and see if it was her brother and she could, she could possibly be reunited with a brother she lost, but that would put her family, exactly, now her children at such a great risk. 
Oh, it's just she had to weigh them up, and when she weighed the two up, it really was that her children were more important. And I we, totally I, agree with that. that to, a, to a certain point, we really do. I totally agree with that. I think that had she seen, and and that's why it's so questionable to me that that she didn't see them because. And, and this kind of goes to the heart of the story that I told about her and Henry, that her love for him was so ginormous that she would do anything that she could to protect him and protect those children. Yeah. Because if she, if she acknowledged that, yeah, this is, you know, my brother, Richard, who takes the, who takes the throne? Yeah. I mean, you know. that. So she, you know, and it's, it's astonishing. Is Edward the Fourth was so popular um, because he brought this peace to England for so long. He was so popular that if the people had any inkling that this boy could have been his oh, son, they would it would have formed. Been, would have absolutely blew up and he would have had so much support behind him. Um, and it does beg the question, what would happen to Elizabeth and her children? Would her brother, if he was her brother, be as kind as, be as, you know, right. would he be cutthroat himself and, and feel the need to remove Elizabeth and her children for his safety? Well, one yeah. of the things that we've never heard from Perkin Warbeck that I know of is what happened what happened in the tower yeah nobody i mean theoretically he knows his brother is dead and yeah. how he died and where he is and you know and all that kind of stuff but that is never ever touched on that i know of yeah you know so if perkin warbeck is was richard duke of york surely he had cards he could play yeah. I yeah. Mean, that's how I see it. And I don't remember in anything, you know, the only thing I remember that, that, that was that Margaret of Burgundy had him spit out facts and, you know, uh, we were, we did this and we did that and things like that. But that's coachable. You know, that's all coachable. So, you know, without yeah. him saying, this is what happened in August of 1483. You know, yeah. how, how can you even? Yeah. Well, yeah, and I mean, I think that is one of the reasons why the Perkin Warbeck thing has never sat with me in terms of there being any truth. Um, okay. Simply because the mystery would be solved. You know, it's a sure. mystery. It's still it's a totally solved. We wouldn't yeah. be having a discussion about the princes in the tower. You know, it would be Edward V was killed on this and this date by this person. Yeah. You know, and that would be it. And then Richard, Duke of York, whatever, whatever. You know, did he chase Henry Tudor off? Did they have a fight? You know, another Bosworth and, you know, whatever. And I think that that's what it would have come down to if, in fact, he was Richard, Duke of York. And if, in fact, he was able to rally, you know, the... Yorks back together again and, and do something, I think it would have come down to something like that, a, another fight. Um, and then it becomes, you know, and then it would have to be Elizabeth was his sister, that's it. And that those were his nieces and nephews and that's it. So there goes the Tudor dynasty. Yeah. Do you, oh, this ah. about earlier that I, I wanted to touch upon. Does it strike you that the Tudor dynasty wouldn't be a thing without women um oh you know obviously logistically it wouldn't be a thing without women um but the tudor dynasty was built on these pillars of strong women it's absolutely you're absolutely right when the we, men fall to the wayside you yeah. know yeah the, the men the men were the kings you know we had the kings and they and they did their thing but the women absolutely built it and kept it going and it wouldn't be what it is without the women it, it, it is mind-blowing when you when you say tudor dynasty okay who is the first person that comes to mind henry the eighth 
I, I don't think anybody else would say anything. But let's look at Henry VIII, for God's sake. Why is he, why is he so well known? Not important, but so well known. His six wives. Yeah. Okay. And right or wrong, you know, they were who they were, but they were all strong in their own way. I mean, I, I'm actually taking a class on the wives of Henry VIII right now. It's really pretty interesting. Um, wow. Yeah, I know, because I figured you'd quiz me on all this. Um, <laughs> but, you, you know, but then the second, because I don't, I don't think most people, most people see Elizabeth I as kind of standing alone, this huge... <laughs> You know, you know this huge Elizabeth of one, Elizabeth one, but of course she ended the Tudor dynasty beautifully. I mean, she just wrapped it all up and said, "We're done." And I really, I really respect that. Like, yeah, we're done. We're we're, done. Yeah, and and there's a part of me, and we have discussed this, that believes that was intentional to a point. I believe it was. I, you know, but again, that that just does just calls for so much exploration of, of Elizabeth one. And, you know, everybody thinks you picked her apart. We picked her apart and picked her apart. We know all these things. I'm still not convinced, you know, that, that, that she wasn't driven to end it all, you yeah. know, with her, yeah. you know, based on what happened with her mother and her father and, you know, and of course, is we've got a span of three generations here. This is the absolutely the greatest dynasty. You know, when whenever we talk about English history, it's the Tudors. The Tudors are the absolute pinnacle of British history, um, uh, British royal history. It's the one everybody loves. There's countless numbers of TV shows about it, and and podcasts and stories and books, and it it goes on and on and on. And all we've got is three generations. You yeah. know, we've got Elizabeth and Henry, we've got Henry, and then we've got Mary and Elizabeth, who were sisters. That, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, we've got dynasties that go back hundreds of years. And then okay. we've got this, this little dynasty. Yeah. And, oh boy, you know, there were a couple up in there that we, Eleanor of Aquitaine. And, yeah. You know, yeah. But Other. I, will, I will say this too. With all due respect to all the kings of England, when we think of the monarchs, we think Elizabeth I, Victoria, and Elizabeth II. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. That That's, says it all. That, that it does say it all. Because yeah. the fact of the matter is, is that if you look at the British monarchy, it is, you know, it stands out. It's punctuated by these yeah. very strong women. And yeah. I don't think they get nearly the credit they should. I don't. And I think the great thing about about Tudor history, I was having a conversation with my boyfriend's brother earlier, um, and he sort of brought up Henry VIII, and it, you know, he doesn't have an interest in history at all, but he knows who Henry VIII is. Oh, yeah. Henry the Tudor. That, that, that <laughs> bastard. <laughs> Brother seven, um, and even he can tell me who he is. He can tell me a bit about the Tudors. You know, he he's quite interested. He wants to visit the Tower, and it's just it's phenomenal that for the amount of years this dynasty actually existed, the impact they've had on our world. I mean, they changed the face of England. You know, That's, you know who we've left out. And when you said the Tower, this is what made me think of it. Lady Jane Grey. God knows. You know, oh, that's great. another podcast you on know. its own. Another podcast on its own. I know. And, and here's the thing. Where in history of anywhere do you have this amount of women who changed an entire country? I know. There's it nowhere. Happen. And it is all women. It is all women. Um, and the reason our country, I mean... I'm, I'm going to throw it out there. I, I can't not talk about it. The reason this country is, is Protestant is because of a woman. It's because of Anne Boleyn. It's, he wouldn't have done that on his own. No. Yeah. Nobody would have done it. You know, nobody would have done it because it would have stayed. And, you know, they, you wouldn't have had any reason for anybody to change it. And it would have stayed the way it was 
through today, okay? I mean, because, you know, we've seen, I have to give Elizabeth too so many props yeah. because she has seen more change than Victoria did. Yeah, she has, absolutely. And so the world she knew, she's known has absolutely flipped on its head in the last, last generation, in the last, in the last few years even. I mean, the things, the things we, we deal with today and the way society is and, and even down to the technology we have is completely, I mean, from the forties, you know, and, yeah. and it's so amazingly different. And I, um, well, I, under, I get that you guys split it off, you know, with parliament, and, you know, and I understand how all that came along and, and how it generated from the Privy Council on down. I understand that. And I understand that basically she doesn't have, she has nowhere the power that her ancestors had. But she is such an icon and such a, an example of class. She is everything a queen should be in the sense of, you know, my nan always spoke about, uh, when I was younger, I used to say, you know, she can't be queen forever. She's getting on a bit now, you know, she, surely she's going to abdicate. And my nan always said, no, she said when she came to the throne, the only way she will leave that throne is when she dies. She will never abdicate. And it's just, she, she's so, I mean, she's, what, 94? Is she 94? She's, she's up there. And I she's still getting ready to cruise to a hundred, I think. I mean, she's still, yeah, she's still somehow doing it with such grace and and um, energy and vigor. And, I mean, honestly, if how I, does she have energy at ninety four? Is I just want to be able to get dressed at ninety four, and she always looks, you know, everything, I, even yeah. her masks. <laughs> you know, when your masks are color coordinated to your outfit, you know you've come a long way. I mean, the things that she has seen, and it, wouldn't it be, I hope, I hope somewhere it's all written down. I hope somewhere there's diaries or journals and all these things to let us know what she thought because she's so inscrutable. In, I mean, with Victoria, Victoria was a hundred years ago, you know. Yeah. Um, I've actually got a book and it, it's Victoria's diary entries and it, it's, it's beautiful. You get this insight into this unbelievable woman. But what's strange to me is the way we're talking about Victoria and further back now, in a hundred years, people are going to be talking about our monarchy like that and us like that. And, you know, it, it's amazing. I <laughs> yeah, I get, hope. Get yeah. Trump out before he blows up the world. Wow. I mean, you might have Kanye West soon. No, so. no, he, he pulled it. Oh, did he? he I did decided, even... <laughs> when, he, when he did, I said to my friends, I said, oh my God, who to vote for now? <laughs> my mum goes, you know, I just think, I just think he might get in. I said, you know what, mum, honestly, at this point, I don't think I'd be surprised because I, you, can elect Trump, you can elect anyone. I, I honestly, and I don't really want to get on all of this, but to live in the United States right now is surreal. Yeah. Because there is absolutely nothing. We have gone into the twilight zone. There's so much gaslighting. There's so many lies. Everybody's, everybody feels like they themselves are the most important. Okay. This whole Trump thing is devastating to true Americans. Yeah. And we worry as much as you do about what happens on November 3rd. Yeah. Which yeah. is why I'm coming to England on the 7th. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. It does affect, it, you know, it, as much as it affects America, it affects us hugely too because. Who wants to be, he could kill us all. That's that's the scary thing. That is truly the scary thing. And some of the world leaders at the moment are just scary. They're just I mean, 
don't get me wrong, and I don't like to go into politics too much because I don't feel I'm versed enough yeah. in politics. I can really speak to how I feel about yeah. what, what's going on. So, I mean, when I, when I say certain things, you know, I don't want to act like I'm educated with it because I'm not. I, I understand the basics. Yeah. I'm bad. But, <laughs> um, I mean, going into it, when Boris Johnson was elected or whatever as prime minister, I was absolutely like the guy's the guy's a moron. He's an absolute uh, you know, I he was always the comedy guy to me. He was never a <laughs> right politician. Um so when he was elected it was a bit like, oh well this ain't gonna last long. But I've got to give the man his dues in there's parts of this corona COVID business he could have handled a lot better. Um, but he's just, you know, a guy who's been thrown into an absolutely unbelievable situation. Oh, it's, a, it's a nightmare. Yeah. This virus I mean, is a nightmare. And, you know, part of me thinks, well, okay, Mother Nature's having her way with us now because yeah. we haven't listened to what we should have. I mean, we, you know, we haven't. And so there's so many issues right now it's not just all economic it's not all health it's not all this it's not all that that i think the entire universe or the universe as we know it just keeps waiting for the next shoe to fall yeah you know it's, it's like it, how much worse you know they were talking about murder hornets that cracked me up and then we were gonna have you know all these things so when kanye announced <laughs> i was like it's yeah, okay, might as well. <laughs> I was like, okay. I mean, honestly, as far as I'm not one for reality TV anyway. No, um, me either, because living reality is tough enough. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm not one for it, but if they want to. I, I just mean, want it to be over. With it. It's like so much bad stuff has happened in that sense that it's like, okay. We've already had Trump, right? <laughs> you know, and and honestly, he'd be terrible. I mean, we know it. He's his ideas are. I don't what? even think he. You know, I I think if it, he has a new album dropping, so I think that's what this was about. But I would have. <laughs> the thing, the thing that the the thing that really frightens me as an American, is all the loopholes that the Trump presidency has shown that's yeah. wrong with our constitution and our democratic process and all these things that are so terribly, terribly wrong. How do we come back from this? How do we come, you know, because in the past, we've, as Americans, have assumed that the people that run for office or president have integrity. Yeah. Okay? at least act like you have integrity. And yeah. Trump has blown all of this out of the water. There is nothing, no preconception left. The, the entire job description has to be rewritten. Everything has to be redone. And I wonder if the United States has that in them. I, I, and I mean that sincerely, I just don't know. I because think there's time when, when we're separated from the Trump situation. I think there's going to be a point where we can look back on it and learn from it, and I think that's excellent. But I think the issue we have here, and I've heard this a lot over the past year or so, is that history is repeating itself, especially these people in places of power. They've not seen the past and learned from it. They've actually just tried to replicate it, and it's where we're getting the issues, is that there's no big change. Um, and and I mean, especially, you know, we've had all this, we've had this Black Lives Matter stuff going on at the moment, which is wonderful because it, I mean, it needs to happen. It's sad in the way it's, it's come about, um, but it, it just needed to happen. And it's just, this world needs to change so much because what saddens me is in this day and age, we're still not accepting, you know, there's still people who don't accept the LGBTQ plus community. Um, there's still people who don't accept people from a different, um, background from them, and it's just uh, oh, why and, and the worst part about it is that the Trump era has entitled these people. Yeah, it's it's given them permission 
to be as base as they would like to be. In other words, there's no, you know, any kind of social convention with respect to being, you know, nice or considerate or whatever. That's all gone. It's it's all about I'm not going to wear a mask and you can't make me. Okay, if your life, if you're the thing that slays me about that is that these people that are screaming that I'm not going to wear a mask because it violates my constitutional rights are the ones that would yank Roe versus Wade. You know, all babies' lives count. Yeah. Well, you know, this is kind of incongruous. Can't you see that? That, you know, you're, but they don't. And I'll tell you the most ridiculous things I've seen this year, and there's been a lot of ridiculous things this year, is there was a protest in Bristol. I believe it was, it was in Bristol, but there was a protest in Bristol where I live, um, or local to Bristol anyway. And it was a protest against the coronavirus restrictions. It was a protest against the lockdown. Now, the most ridiculous thing I have ever seen, and I had to laugh because it was just unbelievable, were these people had gone to this protest to protest their rights against this lockdown. And some of them were wearing masks. <laughs> no, I, it's like... I know it, it's. It, and by the way, I meant to congratulate you. I saw this yesterday, where yeah. Bristol put up that new new statue. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Uh, it was it's, amazing. It's so just that statue, and I was reading about it, and it's just this. It was just the moment that someone had captured after a Black Lives Matter protest, and it was this girl, and she just she did that pose, and it was just captured. It was just one of those beautiful moments that you just happen to see. Um, and this person's made it and he's, you know, he's made it something that's going to last forever now. And, and put, it's it, it put it, it's like from the ashes of the one that you guys tore down to yeah. this, you know, and it's perfect. It was perfect. All right. We need to wrap this up, girlfriend. But um, I find I've, I've, I've been so proud to be Bristolian over the last. <laughs> you should be because well, yeah, that's better than London at this point all okay. right who are we doing next time uh Kaspar? no why are we going in order it'd be Catherine of Arden. okay let's do that then let's go in order yeah okay let's do in order um i think we're gonna i think we're gonna skip you know the men we'll talk about the men yeah but, but i think we're doing this woman power thing and i yeah. really think that I'm loving it. I'm loving the way it's going. So let's let's keep talking about these women that changed history. And I I'm looking forward to doing Catherine because I've um I'm of two minds on her. But, I'm completely. Mind on her. <laughs> but regardless, her strength was just off the charts. So I mean, you know, on one hand with Catherine, I think she was the strongest woman in the world, and and I I look up to her somewhat. And then on the other hand, I think she was totally <laughs> selfish. Right word. She she just you know she didn't think outside her bubble necessarily. So it'd be interesting to talk about her. I've never really done Catherine. I've always kind of skipped over as well. Not yeah. in an awful way. Um, but she's just not someone I've sat down and had to research much before, um, apart from writing the book. So. Well, this, will be, this will be fun so we'll do that one next time yeah. all right okay. we're out of here then uh see you later thank you holly Bye. we <laughs> you have been listening to the history brats podcast sponsored by churchill publishing where your creativity is our priority catch us on facebook and youtube as well as at churchill-publishing.com. See you next time.